Hi, good morning. Um, welcome to the Open Source and Bioinformatics Miniconf. I'm Alan Rubin, and this is Aaron Darwin. Uh, we're the organizers. Uh, thank you all for, for coming today to our first session. Our first speaker is Dr. Martin Smith. He's the head of genomic technologies at the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics here in Sydney. And today he's going to tell us about disruptive DNA sequencing. Good morning, everybody. Um, can I get a quick show of hands if you're a bioinformatician? Good. All right. So um, I guess given that I'm opening this bioinformatics mini workshop, I'll give a quick overview of what bioinformatics is. Uh, James will talk about this. The next speaker will talk about this in more depth. But in essence, bioinformatics is just an umbrella term for anything that involves biological data and, and software to analyze it. So there's a whole bunch of, of disciplines of bioinformatics, and they kind of all interlap with biology, maths, physics, um, software engineering. Um, <clears throat> but uh, probably one of the most popular branches of bioinformatics at the moment, uh, or one of the most diverse and, and wide, widespread, is, is definitely genomics. Um, now, genomics is the study of the human genome, or other genomes, not just the human genome, any genome, really. And it kind of overlaps into other um, areas as well, biology. But in case you don't know what the human genome is, you've probably heard the term flying around. It's, it's the, the sum total of all DNA in one of your cells. Um, so you know, body's made of tissues, and each tissue is made of cells. And within the cell, you have a nucleus of the cell that contains all this genetic material. Um, 46 chromosomes, one from each of your parents. And these 46 chromosomes contain the genetic blueprint or the code of life, what makes you, you. To give you a sense of how big the human genome is, there's a really cool TED talk on how to read the human genome and build a human being. If you haven't seen it, I invite you to, to, to watch it at some point. It's really cool. What they've done is printed the human genome out on these massive books um, in, I think, size 8 font. And there's 260-something odd books that make up the human genome. That's over 262,000 pages. And each page kind of looks like this. Now, what's interesting is only about two pages of that actually have known functional um, bits of DNA. The rest, we kind of don't know really what it's doing, but we suspect um, they have regulatory roles in making cells different. I'll get back to that in a minute. This amount of information is phenomenal. So if you took all the DNA in your body, you'd roughly have enough to go from the sun to Neptune six times if you stitched it all together and pulled it out. That's, what, 24 tr uh, billion kilometers of DNA in your body. Now, how, how do the cells keep track of all this information? How, how does that much genetic material stay in the nucleus of a tiny cell. Uh, the DNA is, is wrapped up in these molecules called histones, and the histones get spindled together and then form these compact tar balls, if you will, or, 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 or compressed um, formats of, of genetic material that make up the whole chromosome. So there's a whole bunch of information in there, and genomics is trying to make sense of all this information, usually through really high throughput methodologies. If you look at anybody in this room, um, you're going to share 99.9%, 99 99.95 actually, of, of the same genetic material. So even though we might look completely different, we're all really similar to each other. What's, what I find really fascinating is if you compare any two cells in the human body, even though they're completely different, have highly specialized functions, they still share the same DNA code. What makes them different is how genes are turned on and off. Um, and genes, only, as I mentioned earlier, genes only make up about 1.5% of the human genome. So the rest of it is largely unknown, what they do. We, we do know that there are some biochemical, there's some biochemical evidence for activity, largely through the conversion of DNA to RNA. But I won't touch on that too much today. Essentially, there's a large chunk of our genome that we don't really know how to um, interpret yet. So this is the evolution of DNA sequencers. So genomics is highly 
predicated on uh, the power to sequence DNA and to read the individual letters of DNA and, and stick them together and make sense of all that information. So 30 years ago, uh, we had these really large bulky machines and they cost a fortune to run, uh, but they ultimately led to the first draft of the human genome sequence. I think it cost billions of dollars and took about 11 years to complete. Um, you'll notice every decade or so, there's a pretty substantial leap forward in the, the, the technology and the capacity of it to output uh, genetic information. In fact, just a few years ago, there's uh, this, this new format of sequencer, this new technology that comes out that fits in your pocket. It's really tiny, um, and you'd think that something this small wouldn't be that powerful, but in fact, this thing can sequence your, your whole genome in, in less than two days. Now, to put that in contrast, um, there's probably a lot of um, people that know about the evolution of computers here and Moore's Law. If you look at the evolution of computers to get the same kind of scale of technological advancement, you, we're not talking dec uh, a decade, but rather one or two decades or even three sometimes to get down to that, that level of refinement in, um, in technology. So genomics is really, uh, or G DNA sequencing is really advancing at, at uh, breakneck pace. This is a, um, a classic diagram in genomics where uh, in red you have Moore's Law for computers, which basically says that the number of transistors doubles every couple of years. Or I, I don't know what the exact formulation of it is. But in blue you have the equivalent for DNA sequencing. And you can see that it's, it's no longer linear, but rather um, almost kind of quadratic. You get these big dips in the, um, with these big massive advancements in the technology. Give you another scale of grandeur. Uh, this is a screenshot taken um, from the biggest database of DNA, public database of DNA sequences uh, at NCBI, um, which is run by the US government. And it's actually not supported for the past few days because they've shut it down. But uh, you, you'll notice that so far, we've sequenced over um, a quadrillion letters of DNA. And that, well, we haven't sequenced that much. We've shared that much. There's a lot more information that's sitting on researchers' computers and servers and stuff. But this is probably going to be like the, the most data that we generate, um, the, or the biggest source of big data for humanity in the next few decades. Um, and it's only going to get worse. Um, technologies such as this uh, will, will leapfrog us to the, the, the next level of genomics. So, I'd like to show you this little uh, clip from Gattaca. If you haven't seen it, it's a really good movie. Um, produced 20 years ago by Danny DeVito. And it's about the future and, and genomics and kind of space exploration and stuff. But this scene is particularly interesting. There's been a murderer in this workplace, and they're trying to track uh, the murderer by sequencing DNA that they find around the building. And within seconds, they're capable of identifying an individual based on a single eyelash. So 20 years ago, this is kind of like, oh yeah, this is some crazy sci-fi stuff. But the truth is, we're, we're not too far from that. In fact, today, we can sequence, we can gather a sample of DNA, extract the DNA from it, and sequence it in less than 20 or 30 minutes and identify an individual if your genome has already been sequenced before. So it's a bit scary. And, and that's kind of where this whole disruptive DNA technology is going. Um, if I asked you guys, if, if you had your genome sequenced, how many of you would, would be willing to share it publicly with, you know, the whole internet? All your genetic information, all, all your health information, your, your genetic blueprint, your code of life. Hands up if you're keen to share it. Well, James is the only one that's not interested in having life insurance, it seems. Um, but the, the fact is that we can now sequence, if, if you're afraid of sharing this information, when this session is done, I could go and swab your seat or your, or your, um, your bench top and sequence it and piece together your, your genome um, fairly easily. So we're kind of, there's not going to be much genomic privacy in the next few years. A bit scary to think about. So this is the current generation of DNA sequencers. This is the same technology as this guy. It's Oxford nanopore sequencing. It's called a smidge ion, and it plugs into your smartphone. Um, and there's a tiny little chip on there, and the chip is basically where you load a sample of DNA. Um, you open up your Android base color, press start, and it sequences DNA from that chip um, on the fly in the field. All you need is your phone's battery and um, some DNA. Now, we don't, 
um, the smidge ion isn't quite ready yet. It's still in development, but it should be out sometime this year. This, uh, this guy, the min ion, has been around for about four years now. And it's been used to track the evolution of Ebola virus outbreaks a few years ago in the fields. Um, all, last year or a year and a half ago, they also went to Brazil and sequenced mosquitoes to track the evolution of this uh, Zika virus outbreak that's been going around. NASA has also been using it. They've um, put it in submarines to test it in extreme environments. And uh, just last year, you might have seen it, I don't know if you've seen it in the news or not, but NASA brought it onto the International Space Station and are using it to sequence um, bugs in the space shuttle. So it's the only sequencer you can take up into the ISS at the moment. But probably one of the biggest advantages of this kind of technology, for clinical genomics at least, is the real-time nature of it. Um, as you sequence the DNA, you can actually analyze it in real time. You don't have to wait three, four, five days to get the results back in a big bulk file. They get they stream out of the device onto your hard drive. So th this has great potential to massively reduce the turnaround time for clinical sequencing. Right now, it takes several weeks to get a whole genome sequence back um, from a, a service provider. Well, um, in the next few years, it should be a available within a couple of days. So the technology works um, by using these nanopores. So a nanopore is a protein uh, that's been engineered uh, or modified from bacterial, normal bacterial proteins. And it's just a nanopore. It's a small pore that goes in a membrane. And DNA gets tethered through it when you apply an electrical current across the membrane. So DNA is negatively charged, which means you apply a positive um, current on the other end, and it'll go through. As it goes through, there's a tiny sensor that can measure disruptions in electronic current. And from those disruptions in current, you can then piece together which molecules, based on the relative size, have gone through and stitched together the letters of the human genome, or any genome. This is what the data looks like. Um, the y-axis is picoamps, and the x-axis is time. So the black bits are when the pores open and there's high current. And as soon as a bit of DNA goes in, the current drops and squiggles around, and that's what gets interpreted by the computer afterwards. So if you zoom into the current, here you can see uh, the different colors represent individual DNA bases uh, or letters in that raw signal. So this opens up great opportunities for machine learning and, um, and deep learning, and the process of converting that raw signal into ATCs and Gs is called base calling. Now, initially, they use fairly uh, simple statistical models to do this, called hidden Markov models. And the accuracy has gone up and up over time, just with more refined computational tools, such as um, neural networks. Sadly, the software, the initial software to do this base calling was all proprietary, owned by the company that manufactures the devices. But of course, um, the, the company is keen to get the, the community to develop tools for them and, and make things better through open source software. And there have since been a plethora of other tools that have come out. So here highlighted in orange are the uh, proprietary um, code. This is the proprietary codes. And all the other ones are open source um, tools that have been used to, to base call. And you might notice that some of the open source tools do a mighty good job. In fact, one of these was uh, developed here in Queensland called Chiron, which used an alternative neural network to the one that the manufacturers developed. And uh, it, it performed quite well, and in fact, so well that eventually, oh, it's all open source, by the way. Eventually, the manufacturers announced, well, look at this. We're using a new kind of neural network. And they basically took the open source code and enhanced their own code with it, which yielded a significant improvement in the accuracy of uh, the identification of the letters from the raw data. Now. Um, just to give you an idea of some other advantages of this technology, it's fundamentally different uh, to the other sequencers that we have because it doesn't use biochemical information to uh, infer what the DNA sequence is. It uses physical information, so it just observes the molecules. It also allows us to get ultra-long bits of DNA. All the classical sequencers that, that, are, that have been out previously tend to give us about 100 to 300 uh, bits of DNA in a row, 
So highly fragmented bits of the genome. And that can be really challenging for certain applications because the human genome is really not sloppy, but very repetitive. So there's about 50% of it that's made up of repetitive regions that are present in thousands of copies. So you can imagine if you have a small bit of DNA that goes into one of these repetitive regions, it's going to go everywhere. You, don't, you won't know which region it came from. Now, if you have very long reads, you can basically span across those regions and you can stitch together the segments of a chromosome much more accurately. So we, had, uh, we were the first to generate a megabase long bit of DNA a few months ago. And just this, just this weekend, our record was shattered by, the new record is 1.3 million bases, and it's just going to go on and on. So for some context, you can see that 1 million bases of DNA is about 2% of one of the smaller chromosomes of the human genome. This is where that record-breaking uh, DNA read mapped to. Spans across 83 genes um, and any repeats that are in between there. So it gives you a really kind of a macro view of, of the human genome. Why is this important in a clinical setting? Well, cancer is basically um, messes up cells. It, it, it causes lots of genetic insults, and, and that's ultimately what gets cancer cells prolif proliferating and makes them resistant to therapies. So here's an example of an ultra-long sequencing read from a human cancer. Uh, this read is 473,000 letters of DNA long. And we knew that in these cancer cells, the chromosomes are all messed up. But we didn't, have, we didn't appreciate the extent of which until these ultra-long reads came out. So usually, if you have 473 letters of DNA, it would map to one chromosome, like the previous slide. In this case, it maps to, I think, 18 different bits of chromosome, all contiguous to each other, showing us that these cancer cells basically reorganize, shuffle bits of DNA around, um, and, and keep the, the bits that are beneficial for the cell's survival. Now, we knew that these cells had these recombination things going on in them, but we didn't know what caused it or what were the sequences in between. And with the ultra-long read stuff, we can go and look at the sequences in between those breakpoints, which are all repetitive regions, and learn some more about the biology and the, the etiology of, of cancer, uh, cancer regenesis. So this is the, the, the little guy, not the tiny guy, but the little guy. This guy's got a big brother called the Promethion. The Promethion is 48, um, has 48 flow cells, not just one flow cell. The flow cell is this chip in here. James has a slide talking about them afterwards. Promethion has 48 of those, and each of those cells is six times more powerful than one of these. So we're getting to the point where these machines can generate 50 terabytes of data a day. Our IT support staff fear it. Ruth and so do we, actually. So the, I think the next step from now in genomics, it's not going to be a problem of, of computational power or, or uh, sequencing depth or, or size or anything. It's really going to be data storage and, and managing the intense amount of data that comes out of these machines. Um, and furthermore, each DNA read that comes out of one of these machines is saved as an individual five, um, an HDF5 file. So it makes really, um, it's really intense on input-output operations. So that's it. I'll take any questions if you have any. Um, thanks for listening. And hopefully you've gained a bit of insight into the bioinformatics challenges of genomics and the future of the technology. So any questions for? Yeah. Just an incidental question. Well, you measuring I find that amazing. Uh, no, this, so the, the sensors that are built in... Let me repeat the question for the recording. Oh, the question was, uh, yeah. Pico amps, it's surprising that we can pick up Pico amps, and do we have to drag out the, inf the signal from the noise because it's such a tiny uh, resolution, basically. Um, so one of the fundamental aspects of this technology is it incorporates the world's smallest um, amp meter. So it's, it's, it's highly accurate, and they can probably go into even more um, discriminatory ranges there. They can zoom in probably more, but the, the amount of disruption you get isn't that much. Um, I didn't mention it, but you can even pick up tiny molecular changes. You can discriminate between tiny molecular changes in a DNA molecule. 
So for instance, there's this phenomenon called DNA methylation, and that's when a methyl group is added onto a specific base of DNA. So it's only four atoms extra, but you can clearly pick up the, the signal in the raw data. So can we, in the near future, in, in a couple of years, can we go to the doctor, get sequenced, and find out, you know, get a diagnosis on our cancer or, or what, a, a genetic diagnosis? We're working on that. So uh, that's one of our objectives this year is to try and, and reduce that turnaround time to day, a day or two, e even sooner if possible. So yes. Uh, it uses the graphics card of the phone. It, uh, sorry, the question was, uh, is the processing done on the actual phone, or does it use the cloud, or can it use the cloud? Uh, it's meant to run on the device itself. So right now, this guy runs on your laptop. The base calling gets done on your laptop. You can use, either use the CPU or the GPU. The, there's another version of this that has five cards together, and that runs on a GPU. The GPU is bullet fast. So you, you don't need that much compute power to do these base calling um, operations. It can be run on the GPU of your smartphone. So is uh, all the data generated by this a problem? And um, I, I don't know how to summarize that. It, it, managing all this data, are, what are we doing to manage the, the yeah. insane amount of data? It's not even big data anymore. It's just ridiculous amount of data. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think once we get to like a production, at least for this technology, once we get to more of a production level, we're going to have to dispose of some of the data, either uh, keep just a, a fragment of the data, for instance, lose the raw data and just keep the base call data. Um, but of course, you know, that comes at a cutoff. You can't go back and re-explore. But, you know, it, it all boils down to hard drives and, and storage. Can, it costs money to keep, to, to keep this information. And compression algorithms, as they stand, are still kind of not really the, the ideal for keeping the raw data yet. So it's definitely going to be a problem. I'm all for a moon base that has just cover, full hard drives. Okay, I think we'll take one more quick question. Um, in the back. You mean for the cell itself? Well, I mean, our cells have lots of bugs in them. And that's ultimately what you know causes diseases and 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 the like. I guess. Um, I think. What you're referring to is probably like the manipulation of the DNA itself, the molecules, and can there be bugs or you know, errors in that? Definitely. Um, and it's a well-known problem. And, and it's a problem that's been studied for years, because we're not just starting to do this kind of you know, sample preparation stuff. It's been done for decades already. So there's well-known biases in those steps that we can kind of account for. But anything that's in the actual biological data, then you, you need to use statistics to discriminate between is it an artifact or is it actually biological signal. Great. Well, let's thank Martin for a good talk. Thanks.